Hello, everybody. Welcome to our IPOS webinar about Monsys. My name is Bartu Sarsozan. This activity is provided by IPOS Infection and Trauma Study Group, and thanks to study group co-chairperson, Dr. Mikhail van der Sande. First of all, this webinar has been made possible thanks to Orthopediatrics, who supports IPOS Study Group webinar series, and also this one. Secondly, I would like to thank Sunny Hiltunen, who is behind the organization and technical details of this webinar series. Now, um, is a simple sister really as simple as it looks? This question come to our minds because many times cystic lesions or bones can cause confusion in terms of diagnosis or in terms of treatment. So in this webinar, a distinguished colleagues who are expert in this field will discuss the topic. The first talk is how do we diagnose benign cystic bone lesions will be presented by Dr. Doris Wenger from Mayo Clinic. She is joining us from Rochester, Minnesota. The second talk is about corticosteroid injections. Do they work? By Dr. Cristina Alves from Coimbra, Portugal. The third talk is cystic filling, cyst filling with different bioresorbable bone cements by Dr. Andreas Craig from Basel, Switzerland. The first talk is Cretage or Cretage and Intramedullary Decompression by Dr. Blant Erol from Istanbul, Turkey. And the last talk is results from the IPOS study group on proximal femur, um, solitary and aneurysmal bone cysts by Dr. Mikhail van der Sande, Leiden, the Netherlands. After the talks, there will be a panel discussion about the fracture risk and the indication for treatment with contribution of all speakers. And of course, after the all participants, free to ask questions by using the chat box. And I think we will be ready to listen Dr. Wenger. Good morning. My name is Doris Wenger, and I'm from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I will be talking about the imaging of benign cystic bone tumors. I have no disclosures. In a case-based format, I'm going to review the imaging features of the two most common cystic bone tumors in the pediatric age group. I will provide an update on terminology and a few pathologic diagnostic tools, along with some tips for avoiding diagnostic pitfalls. The first case is an 11-year-old female with leg pain for six months. The AP and lateral radiographs show an obvious eccentric lytic lesion in the tibial diaphysis with a narrow zone of transition where it abuts the adjacent bone. The magnification view shows that the lesion has an expansile component with a thin peripheral shell and benign buttressing of new bone along the proximal and distal margins. An MRI was obtained for further characterization and proves that the lesion is indeed surface-based. It also shows that there is no involvement of the medullary canal. And the axial fluid sensitive images show that the lesion is comprised of multiple fluid-filled spaces with fluid fluid levels indicative of interlesional hemorrhage. I think at this point, the major differential would be between a periosteal ABC and a telangiectatic osteosarcoma. The axial and coronal post gadolin images show that there is no significant internal enhancement, and there are a few subtle septal and a thin peripheral rim of enhancement. The combination of radiographic and MR imaging features are classic for a periosteal ABC, the lack of a solid enhancing component, and the indolent imaging features on the radiographs would mitigate against the diagnosis of telangiectatic osteosarcoma. An ultrasound guided biopsy was performed and confirmed the diagnosis of an ABC. As we know, aneurysmal bone cysts peak in the second decade of life and show a predilection for the long bones of the lower extremity and spine. In the long bones, aneurysmal bone cysts present as eccentric lytic lesions in the metaphyseal or metadaphyseal region. They're associated with expansion that may exceed the width of the adjacent physis and are often associated with a benign buttress of bone along the diaphyseal margin. Although most are metaphyseal in location on rare occasion, as in our index case, they can be diaphyseal, where they present as a surface lesion with chronic extrinsic erosion of the cortex with a thin peripheral shell of bone 
and benign buttressing along the proximal and distal margins. CT and MRI can be helpful for further characterization by defining that the internal character is comprised of multiple fluid-filled spaces with fluid-fluid levels. These can be detected on CT and MRI and are basically indicative of intralesional hemorrhage. CT shows similar imaging features to radiographs. However, they are more sensitive for defining the peripheral shell of bone and therefore can be helpful when, as in this case, the lateral radiograph, it would be difficult to define the shell and exclude a more malignant aggressive lesion. The fluid-filled spaces can also be identified on CT, but it should be noted that they are often more conspicuous on the fluid, on the soft tissue windows rather than the bone windows of the CT. MRI shows, of course, the uh, lesion comprised of multiple fluid-filled cystic spaces that are often relatively uniform in size. However, MRI can be confusing to determine if a lesion is really expansile or destructive with an associated soft tissue mass. And this is where correlation with a CT or radiograph in the long bones would be helpful. It's also helpful to note that aneurysmal bone cysts are often associated with significant surrounding bone marrow and soft tissue edema. And this should not be confused with a more aggressive lesion. In the, in the spine, aneurysmal bone cysts present as a lytic expansile lesion favoring the posterior elements. They may extend into the body via the pedicle, but involvement of the vertebral body alone is uncommon. And they're also one of the lesions that can involve contiguous vertebrae. As a last case for this uh, aneurysmal bone cyst discussion, I would like to present this interesting case of a 12-year-old female who presented with left-sided neck pain and swelling. You can see an obvious large heterogeneous mass. Closer inspection of the axial T2-weighted sequence shows that there are a few scattered fluid fluid levels in the lesion. In this case, I think the differential would also be aneurysmal bone cysts versus a telangiectatic osteosarcoma. In this case, it's extremely important to compare the MRI with either a radiograph or in this case, a CT, where the anatomy is complex and the same information would be difficult to ascertain from a radiograph. We can see that the lesion is predominantly lytic and despite the pathologic fracture has a significant expansile component that would reflect an underlying indolent lesion rather than aggressive destructive lesion such as a telangiectatic osteosarcoma. So the imaging features favor an aneurysmal bone cyst. Of course, we would obtain a biopsy to confirm that impression given the uh, implications from a street treatment standpoint, and it did confirm the diagnosis of an aneurysmal bone cyst. Given the gravity of the situation and the relatively aggressive features, a second open biopsy was performed, which confirmed the diagnosis of ABC, and it also showed, was positive for the USP6 gene arrangement. The mass was resected and fused posteriorly. And I wanted to use this as a discussion to for the pathogenesis of aneurysmal bone cysts. Initially, they were regarded as reactive process by Jaffe and Lichtenstein, and there have been many different theories, but that reactive etiology was supported by the fact that there were ABC-like areas and other common uh, benign and malignant tumors, most commonly giant cell tumor and chondroblastoma. However, more recently, aneurysmal bone cysts um, have been recognized as a neoplasm and an ABC neoplastic cell has been identified that is driven by the upregulation of the USP6 oncogene. One of my colleagues, Dr. Andre Oliveira, has studied this and showed that the USP6 fusion gene was found in 70% of primary ABCs and was not found in secondary ABC or telangiectotic osteosarcoma. And this can be detected via FISH technique on paraffin embedded tissue. Although not necessary, in most cases it can be a helpful tool when in this era of small core biopsies um, can be helpful and also when there's unusual histology or cytologic activity for the pathologist to confirm the diagnosis. The next case is a 15-year-old female who presented with shoulder pain for two months. You can see an obvious lytic lesion with some expansion and thinning of the cortex and a narrow zone of transition distally. An MRI was obtained for further characterization and shows classic imaging features of a benign cyst with homogeneous T2 hyperintensity, no internal, internal enhancement, 
but a thin peripheral rim of enhancement, classic for a simple bone cyst. Simple bone cysts are benign, typically affecting young patients in the first two decades of life. There's a strong male predilection with a ratio of two to three to one, and the majority occur in the proximal humerus or femur. The recent WHO uh, classification prefers the term simple cyst. Although these terms are used interchangeably, they prefer simple cyst over unicameral bone cyst, which by definition refers to a single chamber. Simple bone cysts are central, well-circumscribed, lytic. They often have elongated morphology paralleling the long axis of the bone. They're often associated with some expansion that rarely exceeds the width of the adjacent physis. A nice compare and contrast between the radiographic features of a simple cyst and an aneurysmal bone cyst is illustrated here, showing the central lesion with mild expansion with the simple cyst compared to the eccentric position with marked expansion of the ABC on the right. Simple bone cysts originate in the metaphysis or metadiaphysis as illustrated in the case on the right, but may extend into the diaphysis with skeletal maturation, but rarely cause, cross the open physis. Pathologic fractures are common with simple bone cysts and are the most frequent complication. Imaging following fracture can show a lesion that's more complex with mixed lucency and sclerosis as illustrated in this case, and it can mimic other tumors, most commonly fibrous dysplasia, but in some cases aneurysmal bone cyst, or even sarcoma when in the earlier stages of fracture healing. Pathologic fractures are common, and of course, if you happen to see the fallen fragment in the dependent portion of the lesion, that confirms that it's a fluid-filled lesion without further imaging with MRI or CT. So until recently, simple bone cysts were regarded as non-neoplastic. Recent investigators, however, have proposed in the pathologic liver literature that they may be neoplastic in etiology. They these two studies identified 40% of simple cysts harboring a genetic alteration in the form of an EWSR1 and FUS and FATC2 fusion abnormality. Although I think further work is needed to uh, investigate this subject, they would suggest that at least a subset of simple bone cysts probably represent neoplasms. So I hope this review will help you to be more familiar with the imaging features of benign cystic tumors in the pediatric patient population with an update on terminology and a few diagnostic molecular tools. Some tips for avoiding pitfalls, including the fact that you should always correlate MRI with radiographs for bone tumors or a CT in complex areas of the skeleton, such as the spine and uh, pelvis. Thank you. So now it is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Cristina Alves from Portugal. Thank you, Dr. Wenger, and I would like to uh, thank um, Bartu Sarizosan and Michelle van der Sande for inviting me to participate in this EPUS study group webinar, and I will try to show you why corticosteroid injections work in the treatment of simple bone cysts. As we've seen, they are often asymptomatic and found incidentally on radiographs, but they may present with pain due to pathological fractures. Whenever there is doubt about the nature of a lesion, we should follow with more imaging, advanced imaging like MRI or even a biopsy as Dr. Wenger has shown us. In cases of pathological fractures, I don't think that we can assume that we are facing a simple bone cyst and we should always have an MRI and perform a biopsy before jumping in into internal fixation and thus avoiding a whoops lesion. As we've seen, these tend to appear in the metaphysial area and as the child grows, migrate to the diaphysis Fractures and growth disturbances are complications and only up to 15% may resolve spontaneously. So we should treat them. And why to, do we do that? To prevent or treat fractures, to promote healing, to prevent recurrence, and to also prevent activity restriction, which in our mind is very important in the growing uh, child.
So the main indication for treatment of simple bone cysts is fracture risk. I would divide modalities of treatment into injection of uh, steroids or something else, mechanical disruption achieved through curettage, decompression or drainage achieved through drill holes or internal support. I think it's different to treat lower limb and upper limb cysts and probably in lower limb we should favor internal support. This is an example of how, of how we perform steroid injection. We usually use 11 gauge needle. We put the first needle, we see if we obtain a yellowish serosine green with fluid, then we aspirate the fluid, we put the second needle, we do a, a lavage with the saline solution, and then we inject usually 160 milligrams of methylprednisolone acetate but we can inject uh, up to 200 milligrams. And this is the result in a five years old boy who had uh, three injections. So why do we use a uh, um, uh, methylprednisolone acetate injection? Because the fluid of the cyst has prostaglandin E2 and interleucine one beta. And so methylprednisolone will block these and uh, um, avoid the, them from uh, doing bone resorption. So uh, usually we look for cyst healing, but and uh, new classification is widely used, but there are other outcomes that are important to measure, like activity level or refractors. The only randomized clinical trial that I'm aware of is from 2008 and has proven that steroid injection is superior to bone marrow injection in the treatment of uh, simple bone cysts. The cyst volume uh, seems to be a significant factor and bigger cysts tend to, tend to heal less. And uh, a systematic review showed that the steroid injection may heal up to 100% of cysts, though this is an optimistic uh, view, but uh, the one thing that calls our attention is most of the uh, evidence existing is coming from retrospective studies and only one level one study. This is an example of one of our patients, a five-year-old boy. We had doubts about the nature of the lesion, went to an MRI, it looked like a simple bone cyst, and he underwent a single uh, steroid injection this is the follow-up after six months. About 30% of the lesions may heal with only one single injection. So this is rare, but might happen. Another example, a 16-year-old boy went on to have three steroid injections, and this is him after a one-year follow-up. Uh, recently, some authors from Turkey have shown us that maybe the, uh, looking at the vascular endothelial growth factor in the aspirated fluid from the cyst may give us a hint on what lesions will need more than three injections as this factor will significantly decrease in the cysts that will heal. So something to look into. An example of a cyst which would not uh, heal well is this 11-year-old girl had a, a fracture and come into our emergency department, we let the fracture heal and then went on to doing three steroid injections, but the cyst would remain big and she had pain. So we decided to add uh, intramedullary nailing. And even after intramedullary nailing, she continued to have pain and have a, a fracture. So we went on to add also steroid injection on top of the intermedullary nailing. This is uh, she at 18 years of age. She's now a medical student, but still has her nails in and the cyst is not completely healed, as you can see. Uh, so adding steroid injection to internal support is also an option. And actually the group from Stuttgart have shown that this, with this option, they did not have any further fractures after this kind of treatment. This is also an option that we favor in children with the proximal femur simple bone cysts as we like to give them some structural support and if this does not heal then we can add steroid injection as in this case he was 
age five when we first saw him. And uh, since then, he had several injections of steroid and two changes of his nails. He's now 10 years of age and uh, looking uh, much better, but still not completely healed. So there are some advantages of steroid injections. They are easy to administer. They are not very invasive. Uh, the cost is low and the healing rate is pretty good, up to 80%, and they may be a part of mixed method. There are some disadvantages. Uh, you can think that uh, anything you can put into a cyst may embolize, uh, pathological fractures may recur, and there might be growth disturbances re resulting from the cyst itself, not from the injection, I think. And there, But repetition of the injections is uh, disadvantage. So the, if you ask me if uh, steroid injections work, so the pragmatic answer is yes. However, I call your attention that diverse treatment options allow nowadays for personalized treatment for each lesion and patient. I'd like to thank your attention and we'll pass you to Andreas Krieg, who will talk about uh, injection of bone cement into the cysts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. Uh, just get up. So, yeah, have to close it here. So, can you see my screen? A little bit of yes. see my screen. Okay, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you for the invitation for this interesting webinar. And your colleagues and friends of APOS, I'm pleased to present my experience in treating simple bone cysts with the technique of percutaneous cyst aspiration and filling with bioresorbable bone cement. So I have no current conflicts, patients, and I use the abbreviation SBC for simple bone cyst in this presentation. As already taught, patients with simple bone cysts usually present with a pathological fracture or pain. Some patients with SBC are asymptomatic and are discovered incidentally. There's a non-serious dislocated place uh, fracture, especially of the upper extremity, can initially be treated conservatively with a cast. However, my personal experience has shown that only up to 15-20% of fractured simple bone cysts heal spontaneously only and also abundant colors may initially form it tends to be resorbed after six months and the likelihood of the cyst healing after fracture is low so this leads us straight to the surgical indications recurrence of a cyst just after fracture cyst with high risk of fracture or associated with pain i think that micro fractures already exists here because a cyst itself does not cause pain and one should not underestimate it the consequences of fracture in children uh, children who needed psychological care for a long time for reintegration to normal school sports after the second pathological fracture because at other clinics they consequently stuck to the conservative way and hoped that the cyst would disappear with the fracture. In 2014, Kadim et al. presented this therapeutic review of simple bone cysts in our EPOS journal of the Journal of Children's Orthopedics. The aim of this quantitative systematic review was to evaluate the aim was to evaluate the efficiency of different simple bone cyst treatment modalities. Included studies had to have a minimum sample size of at least 15 patients and provided data on their radiographic healing outcome of the different simple bone cyst treatment modalities. Due to the heterogeneity of the studies and reporting bias, caution should be used when interpreting these results. However, active treatment seems to be superior to conservative wait and see treatment. The only study I'm aware of it with a high level of evidence is the study of James White and his group from 2017. Also, the rate of healing of simple bone cysts was overall low following injection of either bone marrow or methylprednisolone. The latter provided superior healing rates on nearly off the half of the patients. For simple bone cysts, Recurrences must be differentiated from persistent lesions. 
in patients with intracystic injections of cortisone acetate or intramedullary nailing residual radiolucin C's remain for years. In patients with true recurrences, the cystic cavity reappears after primary treatment with interlesional curettage and consecutive bone grafting. In this study, because all solitary bone cysts were treated by an on-block resection or curettage, reappearance of cystic lesions is equated to a true recurrence. Because of this primary relative invasive treatment, which I think it's an overkill, we had a true recurrence rate of the solitary bone cyst of 20% with a probably of local control without recurrence of 80% within the first 36 months after surgery. Our primary goal is the prevention of a fracture by establishing a biomechanical stable situation in a relatively short time with minimal invasive effort. Therefore, when indicated, we perform percutaneous cyst aspiration via two trochas in Basel and use the fluid and tissue components for histological cytological analysis. We inject then contrast fluidum to visualize the cyst and analyze the interval, internal wall situation, also the different chambers, looking mm. for rapid venous outflow or not. This cystography facilitates the differentiation between cysts that can achieve complete healing, negative venogram, and those that tend to show recurrence, repeat venous drainage like on the right side. In the 2012 study by Ana Ramirez, a quarter of patients showed a negative venogram prior to cortisone injection. All patients with this negative venogram achieved complete healing of the cyst. In patients with rapid venous drainage, complete healing was achieved just under the half of the patients near classification one. Try to place the second tracker also for mechanical destruction of the secondary walls or cyst chambers. Also, sometimes I use a circular wire to get rid of the chambers and open all the cysts. When the second tracker is placed, we perform irrigation with hydrogen peroxide. We prepare the cement and inject it slowly over one trocar and use the other to train the liquid. Wait, till, wait until the cement hardens and only then pull out the trocars. Wash out the incision sites to avoid leaking, leaving percutaneous cement residuals. Intracutaneous absorbable skin sutures followed then. Postoperatively, the patient may use his affected immediately, affected extremity immediately and has no restrictions regarding mobility. At the upper arm, he should not do full contact sports for four weeks. At the femur and at the foot, a partial relief with sticks should be done for four to six weeks. Corresponding radiological controls will then take place in our outpatient clinic. Here I show you an example of a seven-year-old boy with a pathological subtrochanteric fracture, was treated with prevot nails. And as you can see, there was still a persistent bone cyst of the proximal femur seven months post op and he had a re-stress fracture. So we did a percutaneous cyst aspiration and refill all the cysts with biological bioresorbable bio bone cements. This is two months after cement injection, and this is four months after cement injection. Final result then, the boy went back to soccer, and this is 13 months after cement injection. Uh, he was completely healed. So we looked closer to the bioresorbable bone cements that we have been using in the last few years on the aspects. Can they prevent really fractures? How is the radiological healing rate and how is about the resorption? Like the patient here on the right side with Kronos Inject, he didn't have any resorptions. So we analyzed 38 patients on three different children's hospitals of Switzerland. And this were the two bioresorbable cements we used in succession. We analyzed the follow factors, radiological healing, activity level, refractures and recurrence rates, resorption rates. Our results showed after an average of two years that initially the simple bone cyst at the proximal femur led to refractures without additional stabilization, such as a blade or pelvic bone cast. The recurrence rate was lower with the cerement, which we used last, but this may also be due to our increasing surgery experience with the cysts. In Infection rate was higher with Kronos, and in a quarter of the case of this group, the cement did not resorb. Almost all patients were able to resume full activity after four to six weeks. 
A quick technical tip about the trocars. The price differences are quite large in our country. We use the cheapest one in Switzerland for Medtronic, but there's a cheaper way. It could be that your visceral surgeons are not so happy and the collegiality will suffer if they find cement residuals in their trocars during the next laparoscopy. Complications can be caused by the nature of the simple bone cyst itself. And treating the simple bone cyst, there are different risks of complications from the operation depending on the method and its invasiveness. Embolism seems to be a particular complication of percutaneous procedures with aspiration. There's only one, only one case report on biosoluble bone cement and simple bone cyst described by Dorian Wood et al. from Texas. In this report, uh, Wood it all described the case of biosimple bone cement extravasating into the bloodstream after a simple aspiration and injection of the calcium bone cyst. The injection was immediately stopped. The patient remained hemodynamically stable. No adverse event happened. However, no further cement injected at that point. Therefore, they stated the follow technical recommendations for this technique. So, me properly mixing of the cement and not pushing in too in a fluid status. Using fluoroscopy to actively visualize the injection process and look for any extravasation of cement. Before injection, the NSSEA team should be notified to look for any acute changes in vital signs. And of course, if you get trouble with the patient, you should stop immediately. post injection imaging of the extremity is required as well. However, the percutaneous cyst aspiration and refilling with bioresorbable bone cements is a minimal invasive, easy technique with low complication rate if you respect technical recommendations. The bone cement systems have lower or comparable recurrence rate in comparison to other techniques, can provide stability and prevent refractures at the upper extremity and ankle and foot, and for the proximal femur additional stabilization is necessary because of the biomechanical causes. Otherwise, you will have a high refracture rate in this area. However, bioreservable bone cements are expensive. Primary Basically, the treatment school should be provide stability and prevent refractures back to normal life for the kids. Avoid recurrence could be is important, but probably the second priority. Intervention is superior to observation in healing a simple bone cyst. Aspiration and filling of synthetic bone craft substitutes like calcium triphosphate, calcium sulfate, and optimal maybe the mixture of both seems equal or superior to all other interventions, but remember the technical recommendations. So, simple bone cysts are not simple. There is still a risk of trauma for bone and the psyche. Activity restriction for a longer time is, not, is probably the consequences, and we still speak about kids. Thanks for your attention, and I will pass to Professor Bülent Errol from Turkey to speak about the curatage. <clears throat> Thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, now, uh, I will talk about uh, curatage and intramedullary decompression for bonses by correlating natural history and treatment goals. As we all know, simple bonses is a cystic lesion frequently presented with a pathological fracture, and the aim of and the aim of treatment. Uh, in children with simple bone cysts is to prevent pathological fracture and subsequent deformity until skeletal maturity. Is eradication of the cyst a goal? I think it's questionable because if you, because if you look at the natural history, uh, as the child grows, the cyst moves away from the physis and an active cyst changes into a latent cyst which is usually, but not always, asymptomatic without a pathological fracture risk. It should also kept in mind that uh, occasionally residual uh, cysts become symptomatic in adulthood. So, even though uh, it's better to eradicate a simple bone cyst by achieving complete healing, probably it is not an absolute goal. Now, if we focus on an original bone cyst, this tumor-like lesion contains dilated vascular channels not lined by <coughs> endothelium. It is always symptomatic due to its progressive growth locally. 
and eradication of the cyst with a low recurrence rate should be the aim of treatment. At this point, we should also remember that complicated simple bone cysts due to previous pathological fractures can have similar radiological and histopathological findings with aneurysmal bone cysts. And sometimes these two entities are treated similarly. This is the treatment schema for simple bone cyst. An open curettage and grafting is in traditional and intramedullar decompression is in current techniques. The literature says that open curettage and grafting is usually associated with partial cyst stealing and relatively high recurrence uh, rates. And it is also a relatively aggressive technique with some disadvantages. However, based on our experience, a partially healed simple bone cyst does not necessarily require reoperation if it stays asymptomatic. In addition, curatage or extended curatage can provide high healing, high complete healing and low recurrence rates. And these are some examples uh, demonstrating complete cyst healing following open curatage and grafting. Now, when we come to intramedullar decompression, we should remember the most accepted etiological theory uh, for simple bone cysts, which is increasing intracystic pressure due to intraosseous hemodynamic chains. The techniques based on decompression with various intramedullar devices provide continuous decompression and decreasing intracystic pressure. They also stabilize the pathological fractures. Roposh reported 32 cysts in long bones, 30 with pathological fracture, which were managed by intramedullary nails without curatage and achieved complete or partial healing in 94% of patients. We frequently use intramedullary nailing without curatage for diaphyseal cysts in recent years. We combine open curatage and continuous intramedullar decompression by titanium elastic nails in large series and achieve high cyst healing rates. These are some examples from this study, the long-term follow-up. In a comparative study in humeral simple bone cyst, intramedullar nailing led to higher radiographic healing rate when combined with open curatage. And percutaneous curatage, intramedullar decompression, and grafting also should be mentioned as a good option with good results if you reach these special uh, instruments materials. When we come to aneurysmal bone cyst, treatment is very straightforward. <clears throat> An extended curatage with high speed burr and electrocotter is required. Some use chemical adjuvants, actually, we don't use. High healing and low recurrence rates are possible, as we have shown in this large series with a long follow-up. These are some examples, some aneurysmal bone cysts from this large series. Finally, I want to mention that proximal femoral cysts, internal fix for proximal femoral cyst, internal fixation should be performed in addition to other procedures to facilitate healing and to prevent complications such as refracture, virus malunion, or avascular necrosis of the femoral head. This is a proximal femoral aneurysm bone cyst. And another example, uh, a simple bone cyst of the proximal femur, which were managed by open curatage, grafting, and intramedullary nailing. And uh, as a conclusion, <coughs> continuous intramedullar decompression is the key for the management of extremity located simple bone cysts. Open or percutaneous curatage are still valid techniques to achieve complete healing in simple bone cysts. Extended curatage and grafting is the current standard treatment option for aneurysmal bone cysts. And internal fixation <coughs> frequently is required for proximal femoral cysts. Thank you. And now I want to pass uh, Dr. Mikhail Van de Sante to present uh, the results of EPO study group on proximal femoral bone cysts. Uh, 
thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to uh, close the session uh, in these uh, uh, five earlier or four earlier really good presentations on all different treatment uh, strategies for uh, the treatment of uh, simple and aneurysmatic bone cysts. Um, I'm going to present some of our experience with the treatment of both with a relatively simple solution and also will present, of course, the data from the EPOS and EMSOS collaborative study on the treatment of proximal femoral bone cysts. So, um, the ABC of bone cysts, uh, kind of uh, well described today, most of these lesions can be treated without a difficult or invasive technique and most of them will heal either with the injection of uh, one of some kind or wait and see or sometimes with some surgery. So indications for surgery are of course unstable fractures or impending fractures in uh, of insufficient cortical containment and of course uh, extra, uh, extra osseous or soft tissue extension that will limit the possibilities for injection therapy. So, um, it is a benign lesion, but still we are somewhat afraid. Some of us do MRIs and uh, biopsies for all. Some of us just put injections in and recognize them on the x-rays. And of course, it continues to be a threefold uh, fear would be the risk of missing a malignancy or uh, creating a fracture in the future or leaving the child with a lot of pain. So, uh, here's a, an example of a seven year old boy. It's actually a classic example of a uh, simple bone cyst uh, with a painful hit in a seven year old child. So the boy was referred to our unit, but in the meantime, uh, we were a little bit late because we could have done this, but we would have done this, but it fractured before he arrived. So we uh, treated him according to our own uh, schedule, which I will show to you later. So here's the other uh, fear that we have of missing a malignancy if someone uh, is diagnosed with a cystic lesion or a lytic lesion, this uh, 17 year old girl in the proximal humerus. I think most of us would recognize that this could be a malignant lesion, but uh, the MRI showed something that could be an aneurysmal bone cyst. Biopsies were repetitively negative for a malignancy, but in the uh, follow-up that uh, was advised, the patient pre, uh, grew a very large teleangiectatic osteosarcoma that had to be removed with a wide unblocked resection and reconstruction. So another fear for things that we uh, could uh, have or experience during the treatment, the diagnosis of bone cysts. So we look at the Dutch uh, uh, lighting principles of treatment of benign bone lesions um, in both aneurysmal and unicameral or simple bone cysts we would primarily treat all children with atoxicrol injections because uh, we have sometimes the feeling they may work a little bit better than uh, an injection or with bisphosphonates uh, or with uh, corticosteroids. And of course, we would treat uh, the uh, rare child with an impending fracture or with a fracture with curatage, grafting, or plating as needed. So here's the results of our uh, treatment protocol that was published uh, recently. Uh, we uh, examined 106 patients that were consecutively treated in our unit uh, over the last, uh, say, 15 years. And about 106 patients showed up with an ABC that, without prior intervention. As you can see, 20 had surgery. Most of them had sclerotherapy, and uh, about 70 patients could be included in the study, of which the majority was treated with one, two, or three injections, and still 
final bone healing was diagnosed on the follow-up x-rays. So the median age of this group was about 11 years, as we have seen before today, and the uh, clinical or radiological uh, outcome was about 83% success after one or two injections, and only a very limited amount of patients, only three, had more than four injections. So 12 patients had bone uh, cysts in this uh, type, and original bone cysts, that were kind of uh, difficult to treat and were finally treated with definitive curatage, and again, one recurrence was found. So recurrence free survival at one, two, and three years was about 90% with repetitive injections, which uh, were more successful in older children and upper extremity as lower leg locations uh, with artificial plate involvement in young children showed a, a little worse outcome than normal. So we had one major complication over the last 20 years in a five-year-old girl at the second injection of Forder ABC. She had an anaphylactic shock shortly after the injection, but of course she also had uh, the uh, anesthetics and also contrast and also local anesthetics. So the final aller allergic reaction was really never found, but after a successful resuscitation, she was uh, able to go to school the next day. So we have only found one uh, anaphylactic shock also in uh, children's treatment of ABCs and have looked at all the anesthetic reports for the 70 children, but only found a few depressions in blood pressure, but no major incidents after the injection. Also, the same results were shown by A.J. Puri et al. in his uh, British joint, uh, bone and joint journal uh, paper on about 55 children that were treated with uh, the same uh, polyconidol injections for aneurysmal bone cysts and also with the same amount of success. So, um, as you can see, the success rates at about five years were all about 90%. And of course, some ha children had more injections than others, but most of them were healed. Um, so the goal was to optimize local control, retain maximum function, and minimize the uh, invasiveness of the treatments. And I think percutaneous injections uh, offer that, of course, unless surgery is indicated. Of course, to 40% of the children, but a redo is not per se a complication. And monitoring for tension drops is, of course, very important, and that needs to be communicated with the anesthesiologist. But this is not only true for injections with atoxysclerol, uh, but also with other agents. Um, we should uh, well, be prepared for a recurrent or uh, ongoing aneurysmal bone cyst when uh, we treat young children, um, and we should not delay weight bearing too much, of course. So. Here's an uh, extremely young child with a cystic lesion of the dorsal side of this femur at four years of age, where we again uh, waited until the MRI was done and a fracture occurred. And the MRI showed this image of an aneurysmal bone cyst in the distal femur with involvement of the growth plate, biopsy was taken, and aneurysmal bone cyst was uh, finalized, and then treatment injection with atoxysclerol in all of the uh, balloons and then six weeks later and as you can see the treatment actually built it in a very uh, successful bone, uh, all visual, uh, normal leg length, and a, almost no remnants of the lesions left. And then some final data on the uh, multicenter study. I'm not going to present most of it because we are going to do that, of course, in Copenhagen at the next EPOS meeting. But we are going to present the results of 174 children that were treated in 11 participating hospitals with bone cysts, both simple and 
enrosmetic, uh, almost the same size groups so of almost 90 patients, but almost the same age. As we see, we had different treatment options, as we have also seen today within this meeting. And in simple boxes, watchful waiting was chosen in about a third of the patients, but uh, not almost none of the patients, of course, uh, healed because this 5 to 15 percent healing rate after fracture is described, but it's not always uh, seen in our clinics. Percutaneous treatments were performed with a relative. The high need for reinterventions and where open procedures show the small, slower, the smaller. Uh, if we compare that to the success rates of NRS thrombosis, we see that too many patients in this group were initially treated with watchful waiting. And as Aranet uh, just uh, said, uh, most of the lesions are progressive, and I have not seen NRS thrombosis heal without an intervention. So I think we should not wait until this lesion causes problems, but treat them in, immediately. And we can choose percutaneous or open procedures, uh, mostly based on our experience, but also on the location and the fracture risk, of course. So the goal is to optimize local control function and minimize mobility. And I think we can add percutaneous therapy for primary aneurysmal and simple bone cysts that is safe and very effective. It's cost effective. And of course, you would not like to use atoxysclerol. Doxycycline is also being used by Shields at all with almost the same results. Uh, we've talked about the risks and the uh, risk of anaphylaxis. And I think that this is uh, all I wanted to say. And I thank you all for listening. And I thank Liz van der Heide for making this great presentation. I will give the words to our group. And we're all getting online. We are going to the questions and answers session of this webinar. Michael, you are freezed. Oh, you're back. Good. Please go ahead with the panel discussion. I think that Professor Van der Sande, your internet connection is um, sometimes your your screen freezes. So maybe Professor Sarizosen takes the lead of the panel discussion and Q and A, please. All right. Uh... Professor Sarizosen, do you want that I ask the questions? Would it be easier? I'm asking. Um, I, uh, by the time. 
Uh, the, there's a question for um, Andreas Craig. Yes. Andreas, do you hear me? Yes, I hear okay. you. Okay, the question is, um, we have seen several skin irritations and wound problems after um, ceramic. What is your experience? Yes. Uh, can you explain what, what kind of problems do you have with ceramic? Skin, skin irritations and wound yeah. problems. Yeah, I because it's um, I had an it is important. I, I think um, what I see is because of the quick resorbable, or the, they resorb quite very quick, and I had problems with ceramic combined with antibiotics with leakage to the wound. I don't had problems with ceramic the normal bone void filler in percutaneous cyst aspirations, particularly in this. I did not have any uh, problems with, with the, when I do percutaneous cyst aspiration and do keep it percutaneous. But I agree when I have an osteomyelitis and I used it for, for open procedures, which I rarely did, it, I had also some leakage, but um, not in the bone cyst and not in the percutaneous procedure. And particularly not at humerus and femur. I don't have problems in this issue, but I agree. I know about this, and that's why probably I change now and do a mix use a bioresorbal some bone cement, which is the mixture of calcium triphosphate and calcium sulfate, because calcium sulfate resorbs very quick. Calcium triphosphate, as you have seen the experience with me with Kronos, was quite late or didn't resorb any anyway. So I'm trying to find now a bias of bones and I'll probably find something which is a mixture of both and keeps it keeps it quite in a just for time in place and slowly resorbs it. So that's it. But in percutaneous cyst aspiration I don't have problems with leakage. Okay. Um Mikael, will you continue or uh, I would like to continue but I cannot see the question. Me too. Okay, shall we go with the with the case discussion or with the questions? I think with the questions. Michael, can okay. I ask you a question? If there's yeah. not a question. Uh, uh, yeah, there there are some questions. Oh, okay, I can't see them as well. Okay, <laughs> stop. That's not involved with it. A second question question but I, um, uh, I don't know probably Andres you can go on with this uh, some of you with any experience with bioactive glass as a cyst filler yes I have what, experience you know? I have experience with bio glass I usually use that when I treat it with when I do curatage of aneurysmal bone cysts not of simple bone because by simple bone cyst I stay with the percutaneous procedure I try to avoid to make a big open operation and curatage and do a curatage. But with anosmal bone cyst, I use bioclass and that works quite good. Also, you have the a little bit an antibiotic effect as well. I have good okay. experience with, in combination with autocraft, of course, not alone, but in combination, okay. that's good. Um, the third question is probably for Christina. Is injection therapy less effective after a pathological fracture in the humerus due to solitary bone cyst or not? Um, I, I don't think so. Um, I don't think that there is anything um, written about it. If uh, patho In fact, many patients come into our clinic after a pathological fracture. So we actually wait for the fracture to heal and uh, only then we decide if we have to do any steroid injection. So most uh, of our patients are diagnosed through that. So I, I don't think it, it makes a difference. Okay, another question, probably you can go on with this also. Um, would you like, um, I would like to ask if we have any experience with sclerotherapy with ethanol, thank you. Uh, not with uh, ethanol. We started using uh, polydocanol, as Michelle has mentioned, 
only for uh, aneurysmal bone cysts, and we are uh, very satisfied with our initial experience. But with ethanol, my myself, I don't have any experience. My uh, former head of the department had some experience, yes, but uh, but we mainly use steroid injection for simple bone cysts and um, polydaconol for aneurysmal bone cysts. Yeah, the same question for the panel. Do you uh, prefer uh, sclerotherapy for uh, simple bone cysts to all panelists? What is your uh, opinion? Uh, I have no experience on sclerotherapy. We will don't prefer it. We also not. I don't have experience with sclerotherapy in simple bone cysts. Okay. I think we. Uh, I haven't shown the results, but we we have about a hundred cases done with sclerotherapy. Um, they tend to respond much better than the aneurysmal bone cysts. So the uh, average injection for simple bone cysts with the uh, same treatment as in the aneurysmal bone cysts with the doxycycline uh, is about one to two maximum uh, injections. And then we have about more than 90% uh, healing of the cysts. Uh, so yeah, I think we have good experience. Uh, I think every center uh, kind of sticks to their treatment that was done before and sometimes I think it's very good that Andreas is looking for new options uh, and ultimately it would be good to have a kind, uh, kind of a flowchart uh, built by us as users saying okay in this case we should use this and the other case we can probably better use that uh, because all have pros and cons of course. All right. There's another question. How to minimize the chance on sampling error in ABC biopsy? Maybe Dr. Wenger say something about that. I didn't uh, hear the first part of the question. How to minimize the chance on sampling error in ABC biopsy? I don't think I've encountered a sampling error in an aneurysmal bone cyst. I think using imaging to guide to perhaps the more solid portion may increase the yield of diagnostic tissue. And so correlating with the MRI or CT to direct to a more solid portion. And if there's anything that looks unusually different or more solid, then I would direct to that point uh, in the biopsy. Right. Another question. Um, percutaneous injection of synthetic graft doesn't remove any biologically active lining. Do you think open cretage with synthetic graft may give improved results? <clears throat> so open to find Yeah, uh, I don't think so because if you do an open procedure, I think it's better uh, to use uh, cancellous grafts. I mean, if the child is uh, too young, uh, you can use cancellous allografts. If it's a bigger, I mean, it's an older child, then you can combine uh, autogenous and uh, allogenic cancer grafts. I don't think that uh, it will add something, I mean, to use synthetic grafts uh, when you do an open curatage. Uh, I think synthetic grafts are better if you do uh, a percutaneous uh, curatage and decompression by using the, the spatial set instruments. So. Uh, I don't think so, yeah. Andreas, did you say something about that? You were talking about the synthetic grafting, so would you say something about that, Andreas? Yeah, I mean, I, I still, I'm the opinion that we, when we deal with simple bone systems, I, I, I would go for the, the minimal invasive way usually and because it's it's not harming the, the, the all the soft tissue and all about that and you know we have this is as uh, brilliant already said it's a self it's a time limiting lesion and i think it's depending on the age 
and I think on the twist and the location, but I would go every time for the first, when I have the possibility for the first trial to go pack minimal invasive and have a chance if I do with cortison or with cement, however, whatever you use, I think it's it's quite better and they 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 can I think I wouldn't do a big operation for like a yeah the simple bone cyst. Only in the biomechanical parts. There I, I do additional uh stabilization with prevotinates on the femur because I learned that the biosorbous bone cement everything what you use will not help or will not fix the the stability. So I had my learning curve with both cements at the beginning. Right. Um, there's another question about uh, the 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 natural history of ABC. Um, are they healing in adult ages? The question is about about conservative follow-up of ABC without complications. Are they heal in adult ages? Is there any is there any is there any wait and see protocol for ABC or or uh, probably the question is about is it always almost always needs uh, treatment because yes, the yeah. presentation is like that yeah. yeah may I answer that yeah yes please I think yeah I think uh, it always needs treatment I mean, reason bone is, is a local aggressive lesion so. Uh, it gives symptoms, I mean, uh, pain, pathological fracture, and so you need to uh, eradicate the cyst. Uh, so I think uh, it's not correct. I mean, if you see a patient, an adult patient with an arrhythmia bone cyst, I mean, to wait and see what will happen. So I think whatever the age, I mean, can be a child or an adult. So if you diagnose an arrhythmia bone cyst, then you have to uh, eradicate the, the lesion, I think. And, and I think what is very important, and Doris Wenger pointed out, it is important to make a biopsy and a good biopsy because IBC could be a secondary IBC by a child tumor, by a different tumor, and particular ABC could look or could be it could be behind, could be an teleangiactic osteosarcoma. You don't want to miss that. So the biopsy is very important. And after the biopsy, you have to treat it because it's completely different biology to the simple bone cyst. You have to do and you have to treat them, not wait and see. I agree. And I would just point out, fortunately, two of the most common lesions that we see secondary ABC in are epiphyseal lesions, giant cell tumor and chondroblastoma. So that can be useful in distinguishing between aneurysmal bone cysts since they don't usually involve the epiphysis. Of course, there can be some overlap where the aneurysmal bone cyst will cross the physis and involve a portion of, but they're not usually centered in the epiphysis. So that's one helpful thing. And then the other thing, just as far as distinguishing between other things with fluid fluid levels, whether it's secondary ABC or just cystic change, like in a telangiectatic osteosarcoma, it's extremely important to correlate with the radiographs. They will be in, instrumentally helpful in distinguishing between benign and malignant lesions when you encounter fluid fluid levels on an MRI. I'm sure you have all encountered the situation where the patients we present with an MRI without a radiograph. So I think it's a really important uh, rule to always correlate with the radiographs. Thank you. Uh, Krishna, there's a question for you. Uh, it's about the time between one injection and the next one in corticosteroids for simple bonuses. So uh, it's usually recommended six weeks. We sometimes extend to eight weeks, but usually six to eight weeks. That's, that's our protocol. And I think the protocol for most institutions. Interestingly, we always did that as well. And um, uh, if you look at the uh, publication by Puri with Etoxosparol, they also did that six weeks, then six weeks. And we have changed to make an x ray at eight weeks, seeing if there is a response. If there is a response, do nothing and then wait until there is either a recurrence of more cystic uh, tissue. Um, for most of the lesions. In proximal tibia, we 
are still more aggressive with the repetitive injections, maybe six to eight weeks, and then maybe three times just to prevent for a long term uh, immobilization of the child. Yeah, we, we also perform the x ray before doing the next injection, and if there is a major improvement, we will wait but uh but yes that that would be the protocol and other questions um upper and lower extremity differences and similarities for simple bone cyst and abc who well, want to answer in in uh, some of the children you can you can discuss with the parents if they would accept a, another fracture in the proximal humerus. But this is something you probably cannot ex accept in a, a lower extremity lesion. So most of the children that suffer from a pathological fracture in the simple bone system in proximal humerus heal within three weeks with a sling and then continue living. So is this really massively problematic? Sometimes if it's traumatic, uh, but if the child is okay with this risk, um, and if the parents can bear with their child jumping from a rock when they always fall, have to choke well, almost before they go and do. But if, if the parents can take it and if the child can manage, probably in a proximal numerous, we can accept more than in lower extremity. Uh. May I add something? Um, yes. <clears throat> I think in the lower extremity, uh, we have to give special attention to proximal femur. So I mentioned, and the other speakers also mentioned about it, because proximal femur is a, uh, is a uh, different uh, localization. So uh, you, I mean, in addition to eradicate the cyst, I mean, whatever technique you use, can be steroid injection, curettage, or whatever. So you more frequently require uh, internal fixation in the proximal femur. Uh, so I think we have to give some uh, special attention to proximal femur in the lower extremity. So it makes a big difference. Uh, there's a question to all panel members. For proximal femur uh, simple bone cyst fracture, should they use sclerotherapy? Um, if, um, I think that if there is a fracture, uh, you have to fix it. And uh, before fixing it, you have to make sure it's really a simple bone cyst. Um, because you can run into problems. So uh, we always will go through an MRI and we'll uh, make, uh, we will perform a biopsy and be sure that this is, a, that we'll not have a, a surprise. It's not, uh, it's proximal femur is usually emergent. Uh, we think about it as an emergent fracture, but rarely it's so emergent. I think we have, must have the diagnosis. And uh, sclerotherapy, I don't think it has a rule if there is a fracture. Sometimes you can use a cast and weight okay. and diagnose. Can, and can I ask you? Yeah, I would like to ask if there is a bone stock at the proximal of the neck, and if you if you can't uh, use um, internal devices, what do you do? Casting, like just Mikhail said. Yeah, if it is a, a small child, yes, but I was thinking of a fracture, displaced fracture. If it is a minor crack, then you can use a cast and then treat it. And in that condition, you you, you can do an injection. But uh, but usually, most of the fractures we've see, we've seen are displaced fractures, not uh, small cracks. Okay. Um, well, it's supposed to be uh, Mikael to, uh, to, to <laughs> moderate this part. I, I would I, like to um, pass it to Mikael if you have any closing remarks or something to discuss with the panel. 
I think uh, I thank you very much uh, for everyone's uh, great uh, contributions. Doris, you've really showed us in 10 minutes how to uh, look at these lesions, interpret their uh, background, and also I think we have all underlined the need to be sure what we are treating. And depending on the center and the radiologists and your experience, uh, we would always advise, of course, to only start treating it if, when you know what it is. And in, in our clinic, I must say, we sometimes go directly to treatment if the radiologists tell us that it is, in fact, an anonymous bone cyst or a simple bone cyst before we go to biopsy. Um, but it's not an it's not an argument for or against not doing a biopsy. I think your your clinic needs to uh, see a lot of these lesions before you can maybe think about that. And I think we've also seen many uh, different treatment options uh, for different uh, locations with almost the same outcome, because all of us have about 80 to 90 percent success. Uh, and I think it's great to have uh, different options because. We've not mentioned the use of cryotherapy. Uh, one of our uh, clinics in Holland uses that for bone cysts or ABC as well. And when we have these recurrent lesions, sometimes we refer the patient to another hospital because sometimes you just cannot use the same treatment three or four or five times and, and, and go to the parents and say, we're gonna try it again. So I think having more treatment options is great. Uh, and uh, and having friends that can be around to help if you your treatment option is failing is also very uh, is far very helpful. Um, I don't have any further questions to the panel, and I think we've uh, managed to uh, complete uh, this discussion on bone cyst for more than an hour. And I of course thank you uh, for moderating the session. And uh, I hope everyone has a, has a great evening or a day if you are across the Atlantic. Um, and hopefully we can meet in Copenhagen live. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.